So he is eminently placed to talk to us, get us thinking about, I guess, what happens politically, what happens environmentally. Richard, do you want to Absolutely. kick off and we'll talk again in a few minutes? Well, first of all, thank you all for coming out for a uh, lecture with the somewhat dreary title, The End of Growth, which is a bit different from what's advertised. This is actually the, the title of the book that I've just finished. It'll be out in uh, July. And the premise of the book, of course, is that uh, world economic growth as we've known it is hitting up against uh, essential limits. And I'll be describing that. Um, I'm, I'm going to argue that the, the economic crisis that started in 2008 is uh, more significant even than we've been told that it marks a fundamental turning point in human history. Uh, to understand it, I think we have to look at more than just the financial aspects of the crisis, but we, we will be considering those as well. We go back to the very beginning of our existence as a species. We used renewable resources, and especially renewable energy resources, for 99.9% .9 of our history as a species. We used sunlight uh, indirectly, uh, as it was gathered by plants, and we ate the plants or burned the plants. And then we altered our environment by exerting muscle power. Uh, now, all of that changed a couple of hundred years ago with the Industrial Revolution. We essentially won the energy lottery. We found ways to use sources of energy that had been created through natural processes, uh, processes we didn't have to invest any effort in whatsoever. It was all done for us over the course of tens of millions of years, the production, gradual production of oil, coal, and natural gas. Uh, I will be using gallons and dollars and, and US reference data through this slide, because that's where I'm from, and I haven't had a chance to convert all of that. But please bear with me. In the US economy in 1850, uh, roughly 85% of all the work being done was being done by muscle power. Uh, about 65% of that by the muscles of animals, horses, oxen, mules, and so on. Another 18% by human muscle power. And of course, in 1850, much of that was slave labor. By the 1960s, muscle power doesn't even show up on the graph anymore. That's because the power of fossil fuels to do work is so extraordinary. Maybe you've had the experience of running out of petrol in your car and having to push your car off to the side of the road. Maybe even pushing it uh, three or four meters is really a lot of work. Now imagine pushing your car, once again back to miles, let, imagine pushing your car 30 miles. That's really a lot of work. That's the energy equivalent of something like six to eight weeks of hard muscle-powered labor. And we get that from a single gallon of gasoline, for which we Americans are paying only $3 and a half right now. Well, you can't get work that cheap anywhere, that, that kind of muscle-powered work. So of course, we have mechanized every process of production and transportation that we possibly could over the past 100 years or so. Mechanization has yielded extraordinary economic benefits. So over the course of world history, we, don't, we see actually very little change in economic activity. Right up to the 20th century, the 19th and 20th centuries, we see the beginnings of what we have come to call economic growth, growth in GDP, gross domestic product. Now that same curve we can find in all sorts of things. The, uh, uh, urban pop population, urbanization has, has burgeoned over these last couple of hundred years as well. The number of motor vehicles, telephones, McDonald's, restaurants, on and on, we could proliferate these kinds of graphs, hundreds of them, and they'd all have the same essential shape. Of course, the most important one is this one, uh, human population, which has recently reached 7 billion, which it certainly couldn't have done before if we hadn't had the available resources, the food, the, the uh, energy to uh, support those people. 
Now, as all of this was happening over the course of the last couple of centuries, we were developing economics, a set of theories and institutions that explained growth and that hypothesized that growth could continue forever. Now, we actually embedded the expectation of growth in our financial institutions. How so? Well, we, we changed even the very basis of our, our monetary <coughs> systems. Uh, up until a few decades ago, money was gold or silver. Over the course of the past few decades, we have dematerialized money. Money has become uh, based upon debt. Money is loaned into existence. Now, of course, those loans come with the expectation of payments of interest. And so it's a kind of pyramid scheme. It works as long as the total amount of debt is growing, which in turn works as long as the economy itself is growing. In effect, tomorrow's growth is being used as collateral for today's debt. Again, all of this is fine as long as the economy continues to grow. Now, back in the early 1970s, a book was published called The Limits to Growth, which is a very famous book. In fact, it was the best-selling environmental book of all time. Uh, the book essentially reports upon some efforts by scientists to use computers, which were very <coughs> primitive, of course, at that time, back in the early 1970s, to model what would happen in the interactions between population growth, growth in consumption rates, and depletion of raw materials. The uh, consequence of this study was, was very disturbing. It was that world economic activity would reach a peak sometime in the first half of the 21st century and begin to decline. Of course, this was a very disturbing outcome, and the limits to growth authors were pilloried in the financial press. Uh, and many people mistakenly believe that the limits to growth study was, was discredited. In fact, what, what happened was that certain numbers were taken out of context, out of the text, and used as uh, hard predictions. Uh, in fact, if we go back and look at the modeling that was done in the early 1970s, it's been extraordinarily accurate. We're right on course. 